And that's another reason. I mean, being from the Chicagoland area, I'm a massive Smashing Pumpkins fan. I have a Smashing Pumpkins tattoo. You uh, do? Yeah. Which, what, what, is it, does it's it say heart. smash? Oh, the, oh, fuck. Yeah, I was actually... Love them. In, fuck. I moved out to Los Angeles 17 years ago, but I lived in Hollywood, and I would just go get random tattoos, and I was listening to some, a Smashing Pumpkins Gish album, I think, which has Gish. the heart on the cover. Cherub Rock? Uh, <laughs> that's on well, that's uh, Siamese, Siamese Dream, Dream yeah. yeah. Jimmy Chamberlain's one of my favorite drummers. Oh, ever. man. I mean, he's yeah. just yeah. incredible. He's incredible. But he's very public, and everybody knows he had a problem with heroin yeah. um, at the end of the 90s. So Billy Corgan uh, fires him after the death of Jonathan Melvoin. Yeah. And he starts working with producer Brad Wood in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Fires Brad Wood, and then yeah. comes into this room we're in right now and does the rest of the Adore album, which was such a pinnacle album for Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. But Rick Rubin's producing, Matt Chamberlain's out here. Um, and then Jimmy's out of the band, and they're using a drum machine. And you know, one behold, the nightmare was done on that piano right there. Yeah. I mean, just the coolest things ever. That's why I love Sunset. But you get involved to tour the Adore record, and dude, this I'll tell you the story. So when Jimmy had that uh, unfortunate Jimmy, by the way, uh, Melvin, he thought. Jimmy had died. They were together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Melvoin, then Jimmy wakes up and Melvoin's gone. So it was a real sad thing. And Billy had to do, you know, he just, you know, he had to immediately tell Jimmy you can't be in there because the press was there. So they had to do what they had to do, you know, to make, to, to handle that unfortunate situation. So when that happened, somebody had reached out to me and I was on tour with Bob Seeger. I sent, I called up management for the pumpkin and said, look, if you need anybody to fill in, I'll just get the, the I can at least finish the tour for you guys, keep making money, honor your dates. So they said, send in your resume. <laughs> and so, okay, I'll, t I'll follow up with that. And then I didn't hear from them. Two years later, when they're doing the Adore album, I'm at the uh, Sofitel Hotel right there across from the Beverly Center. I get a phone call from Sid Bernstein. Kenny, this is Sid Bernstein. We represent the Smashing Pumpkins. I'm like, <laughs> like, what when what the record I, I, they're making a record right it, he says no it's not the record and I'm like oh shit he says well we're thinking we're going to audition a few drummers for the tour I'm like are you kidding I'm like oh god okay he says alright are you interested yes when where he says well I'll get back to you but it'll probably be in a month but I need to ask you a question if you get the gig or you win the audition, can you say yes? I went, well, when is the tour? When's rehearsals? When am I getting paid? <laughs> I can't say yes. I don't know nothing. Yeah. So it was interesting. So I said, Where was well, the audition at? Here? No. So we, I fly. I'm out here doing a record, and I fly all the way to New York. Oh, wow. And I've le memorized and learned every single Smashing Pumpkin song. I get there. Uh, it's raining. I finally get to the SIR, I think it was, at maybe 10 o'clock at night, and Billy didn't even show up till 1. Darcy's on the phone the whole time. James is, hi, nice to meet you, and goes over there. See, this is exactly what happens to a, a lot of bands that have been just going bow, 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 like what happened to Mellencamp. They burn out. They needed a break, but Melancholy sold 8 million copies, double CD, that's 16 million copies, you gotta go back out. So now they make this Adore record, which is a complete departure from anything else. His mom had died, so it was kind of a tribute to her. And, but the band was a little bit fried. Anyway, Billy walks in, just tall and you know, really friendly, says, Kenny, Billy Corgan takes off his jacket, straps on his guitar, he says, listen, we already know, play, know how to play hard and loud and fast. I want to do something more like Pink Floyd, trippy, grateful deadish. I'm like, okay. So he starts doing the textual type stuff, you know, do 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 yeah. cymbals. I start adding Tom something. You gotta get to a beat. <laughs> so do 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 ba do do bo do 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 ba do 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 and I'm like finally went, okay, we gotta go. <laughs> God, and then I started speeding it up and speeding it up, and it's like this: that Billy 
Darcy's looking that way. James is looking that way. And Billy's like right in front of me with his leg extended out. And it's rocking. We get done. And I said, and this is what I think in hindsight got me the gig. I went, uh, is there anything else you want me to do to make it better? And he smiled. And he went, just do more of the same. Did that again. And that was it. And I think wow. I was thinking, I'll probably be on tour with Fogarty. They don't look like they're really into me. <laughs> It was just their way of, yeah, yeah, they were just in their, their own world. Well, they're not like, they're not the type of guy that looks at you too. like, man, it's great. Where'd you grow up and all this? There's no talk. So I am. Um, but I Billy just, was cool. I mean, Billy was the leader of the band. He wrote yeah, the songs. Yeah, and Billy, he, Billy was really controlling nice. Controlling everything. And I was just blown away. I was playing audition with the Pumpkins. I mean, just that alone would have been, fuck. See, you get it. Even before God. working with them, though, there's people that love the Smashing Pumpkins. And you, obviously, you know their fan base, too, which is just Huge. so diehard. And then there's some people that just don't like the Pumpkins. Dude, when I saw on MTV, the world is a vampire. I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? It resonated with me. So... Both I'm butterfly at, wings. I'm, yeah, both about. So I'm in the uh, LaGuardia airport, and I get a phone call from Sid. He says, Kenny, Billy would like you to do this, the Adore Tour. I'm like, one of the greatest moments of my life. It was such a departure from anything I'd done. Yeah. I mean, if you were a manager and you were marketing somebody or something, you'd go like, dude, take Kenny from Johnny Cash and John Mellencamp and uh, Bob Seger and put them in the pumpkins. <laughs> I mean, that, like, and it worked. And here's what happened. I think I heard Sid Bernstein and his partner, M Mesh, Mensch, whatever his name is, yeah, from Q Prime, they went and saw me play. This is what someone told me. It could be all bullshit. They went and saw me play with Fogarty. And I think they were looking at it like, all right, let's, this guy's obviously talented enough. Kenny plays with everybody. They need somebody really responsible that's going to yes. hold the fort down. It's it not wasn't be about a the style even. It was about your persona. Yeah. You're a professional. Yeah. And they need they somebody needed that's that. going to be there studying you know the shit. And you know what Billy said to me yeah. when we were rehearsing? Kenny, don't, don't even try to play like Jimmy. Smartest thing he told me. Don't, don't, and he's right. It would have been suicide. Just you be completely you. And Jimmy told me years later when we were doing a drum clinic thing together in London, he says, we're having dinner, and he and, he and I are really good friends. He goes, dude, you're the only motherfucker that got it right. You just did your own thing. He says it was believable. And the fans, at first, you know, they get, fans are vicious. No, Jimmy, it's my fault, you know. But they didn't. They were like, ah, ah, that's pretty cool what he's doing. That's different. So I wasn't even trying to be like Jimmy. So what did they? Did you have a limited capacity of what songs you could do? I mean, did you play like Tristessa or anything? No. The thing is, what what really pissed off the fans was that J Billy only did three songs from those albums. So it was he, all adore. It was all adore, and people were going. Du, 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 du. They wanted to hear. I kept saying, Billy, we gotta do zero. Come on. And our last show. You guys we did, never played uh, just one time? We did one time. And it was at Dodger Stadium. We opened up for Kiss on Halloween. And it was. I remember that. It was nationally televised. Yeah. It was gigantic. And I was the one that said, we should. Halloween. We should dress up like yep. the Beatles. And Bill went, okay, because we all bought, we put wigs on, and we had a Beatles logo on my bass drum. The audience didn't get it. They go, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> <laughs> so then we go, money. <laughs> <laughs> and we finish, do the Beatle bow, take our wigs off. And B Billy goes, and then I'm like, ah. I was like, I'd been waiting for that the whole time we were on tour. Because he only played Bullets to Butterflies today in 1979. Yeah, not one symbol ones. crash in 1979 either. And they kept screaming. The hits, Cherub Rock, yeah, but, you know, and he wouldn't do it. He just see that's so funny because just two, three years ago they finally did the reunion show, and Live Nation comes and they do big arenas all over. But I had went to so many shows; I've seen them probably over a hundred times, easy. And he would actually tour the record. He believes in like if I record yeah. a record, I'm going to play that whole record yeah. out there. I'm not yeah. going to do a greatest hits every show. And 
I want to create new music, and you're not going to encapsulate me in this shit. That's Billy. I'd love to see you play a- Ava Adore, though, the title track off Adore. That well, we did play. Oh, oh man. That was the one we'd always do all through Europe, like on TV, like Jules and Holland. And I just, we did, and, and we did, uh, we did Saturday Night Live. Yeah, and I think I don't and know if perfect we did. Perfect, too. You guys played. Do we do perfect? perfect? Yeah, and we did Letterman doing it, and it was like, perfect, right? It was all these loopy things I was trying. We he, <laughs> Billy hired two percussionists, completely different. This guy had old shit. This guy was uh, D- uh, Dan Morris had all this you know technical stuff, and I remember going, "Oh my God!" Well, we go off stage at one point. And I go, "Do you have his shit in your monitor?" No. Do you have his stuff in your monitor? No. Can you hear me? Sort of. I said, no shit. It sounds like two lawnmowers <laughs> going at two different tempos. Dude, you got, you, we're a unit back here. And Billy didn't hear any of it because he had a stack of marshals in front of him. Yeah. But it was like complete like <laughs> shit going on all over the place. And I'm like going, I'm just holding everything down. And, and songs, I'd start every song with the tempo off the record with a click so that we were like really sure. doing Dialed I mean, in. I, you got to check out uh, it's August 4th 1998 at the Fox Theater in Atlanta and they recorded it and filmed it it's badass is that on YouTube and it's on YouTube All and right, it's I badass it. dude I, I, it's two hours and 15 minutes and I have to say man the thing just watch how I'm studying Bill, Billy I'm playing I, 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 it was a flawless show really I mean I'm sitting there and you're playing the songs and the tempos, but there's a lot of room for jamming that he likes, and you don't. You, I have to guess what he's thinking. Yeah. There's this thing called radio. We're just doing this thing. Radio, radio. I said, no. I'm trying to figure out this. Radio. Yeah, radio. And he's just, you're just vibing it, and that's what he likes. He wants creativity, and he told told people in interviews, and he was right. So I'm gonna make. I'm gonna have Kenny play things, playing with so many dynamics in this band, and he's right. He had me play so. We'd start the show with, was it Sheila? Was that on that Adora? To Sheila. To Sheila. Yeah. It's like Kenny. We start soft. God. First song, it wasn't powerful, and then it got bigger and bigger. I mean. Fuck, it was a genius. He is a genius. What was it like, real quick, uh, touring with them? Did you guys hang out a lot, or was it kind of like, you go to your room, you go to your room, and let's meet at 5 o'clock, lobby call? Well, first of all, we were in a different uh, country every day. I mean, dudes, we was one day we were in three countries. We played uh, Dublin, and the U2 guys came. We played a small venue, too. The U2 guys, uh, a bunch of them, yeah, the U2, the main, not, not Adam, but the other three were there. And it was interesting talking Mullins, Larry, uh, Larry Mullins Jr. He, he, he's a band guy. He could see all the dynamics. Wow. He just, he, told, he told me shit that was going on. I went, oh, brilliant that you saw that. He could see all the band dynamics because he gets it. So then we got hammered tonight. We then fly on our jet to um, the Netherlands through the, the Pink Pop Festival. And I'm hanging out with Chamberlain, uh, you know, um, Matt Chamberlain. He was playing with... Um, Pearl Jam. Who? Pearl Not Jam. Not Pearl, the, uh, the, uh, Fiona Apple? Oh, yeah, yeah, Maybe. yeah. That was before. And we were hanging, and it was like, and, you know, Garbage was hanging out. I mean, the pumpkins were huge. And then after we do that show, it's like 250,000 people there. After we do that show, we get back on the jet and fly to, to Paris. Wow. I mean, it was like, I mean, <sighs> there wasn't much time to hang. The guy I hung out with most the time was uh, Mike Garson, the keyboard player who was on uh, with Bowie forever. And he, uh, just a, a beautiful cat, like a Buddha kind of guy. Yeah, I asked Billy to come on here. He said he's going to consider it because he said he had such a, an amazing yeah. time making the record in this room. Uh, a lot of good times, he said. So, Billy, we're ready for you. Uh, the next album, Machina, Chamberlain Returns, yeah. which is another amazing record. Had Billy let you know that this was only one tour that you were going to be filling in? I had a feeling because what happened was the day after, the next day after the, um, I kind of told Billy, I, I want to record with the Bumpkins. You know, that means a lot to me. And uh, 
Billy's very sensitive. I mean, he, he there's a, that side of him. Yeah. So the day after the the gig at, with the Kiss Halloween, he asked me to do two songs on a Tony Iommi solo record. Wow. Uh, over, producing? Uh, it was just Iommi. I know. It was oh, but was Billy producing? Or yeah. Playing? Okay. And playing. It was really a, a difficult. It was thirteen hour session on one day, and there was no lyrics. I never heard the vocals until the album came out. It was a great. It was a uh, different producers did different. Yeah, you know, I love that. I think only one song of ours got on the record, but you know you had all these different artists playing with Tony and Billy walks in. I've already met Tony. Tony's the sweetest guy in the world. Billy goes, comes in, takes his coat off, picks up. I thought he picked up a bass, but maybe it was a guitar. He says, Tony, give me a, g g give me a lick. He has a photographic memory, by the way, Billy. Yeah. And so then he says, give me another one. He looks at me and goes, we're in the control room, he goes, I don't know, it's you, <laughs> dog, go to drums. <laughs> so I go, I go to drums. I'm there. And, dude, I mean, they, they, it was just, they were, he was com composing on the spot. And I'd be writing, okay, A theme, B theme, uh, purple feel, green feel. I mean, I just was making up. Finally, Billy goes, no, Kenny, the chorus. I'm like, oh, fuck. I take my headphones off. I go in the control room. I go to the second engineer and says, here's 20 bucks. When they talk, because they were all in the control room recording. I was by myself. When they talk, here's 20 bucks. Hit the talk back button down so I can hear what the fuck they're saying. And I walked out. <laughs> what I studio was like, it? Henson B. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, it wasn't Henson B. Home studio, maybe? No, it wasn't a home studio. Wait, it might have been Henson B. Okay. It was and Henson, though. I think so. Yeah. But uh, you, still sp you still speak with him, Billy? I just sent a message to him, uh, Man Cow. Do you know Man Cow? The, the Muller, DJ? yeah. So Man Cow, I just did a thing, and I said, I'm going to be up in Chicago recording in January. I says, oh, really? Billy, Kenny's coming to town. Let's get together. Billy says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Billy and him are good friends, yeah. Really good friends. Man Cow was a gigantic rock personality, kind of like a Howard Stern on Q101. Yeah. Uh, in Chicago land, uh, still has a radio show. Dude, to this that day. guy got lost his virginity to Jack and Diana in a cornfield in Kansas. <laughs> That's what he tells me. His Chris Farley stories too, or him, him and Chris Farley, because Chris Farley lived in the Hancock Building in wow. Chicago, but they Dude. would hang out nonstop. Can you imagine those two together?